Greetings from Columbia Business School Executive Education. My name is Scott Gardner, and I'm here today with Professor Daron Nassim for today's webinar, Understanding the Basics of Financial Accounting. Before I introduce Daron, I'd like to just go over a few quick logistics. If you'll see on your screen here, a recording of this webinar will be sent to you. If you'd like to tweet about the webinar, please do so at hashtag CBS ExecEd. And finally, please submit those questions to the Q&A box and we'll get to as many of those as possible in the last 10 minutes. It's my pleasure to introduce Daron Nassim, the Ernst and Young Professor of Accounting and Finance at Columbia Business School. Professor Nassim's research is focused on earnings quality, fundamental analysis, equity valuation, financial institutions, and corporate finance. For more than 20 years, he has consulted extensively for asset managers and other financial institutions. He has taught various courses in financial reporting, fundamental analysis, and valuation, and has directed four executive education programs in these areas, including the upcoming Finance and Accounting for the Non-Financial Executive, which will take place March 7th through the 11th. Daron, as always, it's great to be here with you. I know you have a lot of great material, so I'm going to leave the stage and I'll rejoin you for the Q&A. Thank you, Scott. Good morning. Welcome to the webinar. In the next 20 minutes, I will review basic concepts of financial accounting, and then I will answer some of your questions. So what is accounting? Accounting is the process of identifying, measuring, recording and communicating economic events in order to provide information for decision-making purposes. We distinguish between financial accounting and managerial accounting. Financial accounting concerns financial information that is disseminated to external parties, such as investors and creditors, and is based on a set of rules that we call generally accepted accounting principles, or GAP. Managerial accounting, in contrast, consists of both financial and non-financial information. It is aimed at helping managers make decision, and it's flexible in nature. So all three dimensions are different. Financial accounting provides information on business activities. Now, business activities consist of operating, investing, and financing. Operating activities include purchasing merchandise or raw materials for a manufacturing company, producing the products for a manufacturing company, marketing, selling and delivering the goods or services, and administration. Investing uh, is involves acquiring or, and selling assets that provide operating capacity, such as property, plant, and equipment, intangible assets. And it also includes investments in assets that are not used in operations, such as marketable securities. And then we have financing activities, which includes obtaining funds from owners and creditors and providing them with a return on and off their investments. Now, the primary objective of financial accounting as stated by the FASB, which is the body that sets accounting principles in the US, the primary objective is to help investors and creditors. And then we recognize there are other users too, but we emphasize investors and creditors, help them assess the amount, timing, and uncertainty of cash flows to the enterprise. Now, there are additional objectives, including providing information that help managers make decisions and information that help owners evaluate management. But these are not considered the primary objective. So the FASB 
identifies investors and creditors as the primary users of financial information. But then, as you can see on the screen, there are other users of financial information, and that's why we refer to financial statements as general purpose financial statements for many potential users. So how does financial accounting work? Well, we have two bases of accounting, two alternative ways of measuring performance, cash basis and accrual basis. The cash basis of accounting is simple. Revenue is simply the amount collected from customers during the period. Expenses are payments during the period, payments for goods and services. A net income under the cash basis of accounting, simply the difference between cash collections and cash payments, net cash flow during the period. So cash basis, cash accounting, we only have one asset, cash, and it's extremely simple. Cash in minus cash out, that's how well we performed. That's the cash basis of accounting. But that's not the way that, financial, that companies prepare financial statements. Companies are required to use a cool accounting to measure performance. And a cool accounting, basically, revenue is not necessarily what we collected during the period. Revenue is the price of goods and services that we delivered during the period. So if we deliver a product to a customer, we recognize revenue, even if we did not collect cash from that customer yet. And sometimes we get cash in advance from customers. So the cash is already in, but we have, if, we haven't, if we haven't yet delivered to the customer, we cannot recognize revenue. So a cool accounting revenue is focusing on performance and performance is not cash collection, performance is delivery. And similarly with expenses. Expenses are not the cash payments during the period. Expenses that we recognize in the income statement under accrual accounting is the cost of goods and services that were used or consumed during the period in the process of generating revenue. So for example, if we buy inventory and we pay for it, but we didn't deliver it yet, no expense. And net income is measured as the difference between revenue and expenses, just that now this can be very different from the net cash flow during the period. And so we can have many assets beside cash. Accounts receivable, for example, means we deliver to the customer, we recognize the revenue, the customer is not paid yet. We have the right to collect cash from the customer. So we have an asset. We call this asset accounts receivable. Okay. So under the cool accounting, there are many more assets that we need to account for. Financial accounting emphasizes the cool accounting and companies generally are required to follow a cool accounting when they prepare financial statements. So let's dive deeper into a cool accounting. So the primary product of a cool accounting are the financial statements. There are five financial statements. Three are considered primary and two are considered secondary. The primary financial statements are the balance sheet, which is also called the statement of financial position. Then we have the, inco the income statement, which have also alternative names and the cash flow statement. These are the three primary financial statements. In addition, we have a statement called the statement of equity or the statement of shareholders equity or the statement of changes in equity, which basically links the balance sheet to the income statement and also provides additional information 
about equity transactions. And finally, we have the statement of comprehensive income, which as the name suggests, gives us a more complete measure of income, not just net income during the year, which is what we get from the income statement, but also additional gains and losses that the company generated during the year, which have not yet re been reported in the income statement. In addition to these five financial statements, when we look at the financial report, we'll find following the five financial statements, we'll find notes that provides additional information about the line items that we have in the financial statements and also explain how these items are measured. So let's start with the balance sheet. We're going to use the financial statements of Costco, the most recent financial statements, as an example to financial, for, for financial statements. So here we have the balance sheet for Costco, again, also called the statement of financial position. Why? Because it provides information about the financial position of the company. It reports the assets that the company owns or controls. And in this case, for Coca-Cola, the sum up, sorry, for, for Costco, the sum up to 59.3 billion. So the balance sheet lists the different assets, and then it provides information about the claims on the assets. And we have two types of claims. We have creditors claims that we call liabilities, and we have owners claims, which we call equity. And as you would expect, the total of the assets and the total of the claims are the same as you can see on the balance sheet. Now, importantly, the balance sheet provides information as of a point in time, the balance sheet debt. In this case, for Costco, August 29, 2021. So the balance sheet basically lists the assets and the claims on the assets, liabilities, and equity. What the balance sheet does, it basically presents an equation in a detailed way, but still an equation, an equation that we call the accounting equation, where you have assets on one side and the claims on the assets on the other side. Liabilities are creditors claims, obligations, equity represents owner's claims what is left after we subtract all the liabilities from the assets. That's what belongs to the owners. Okay. So here again, assets, which in this case, sum up to 59.3 billion. Creditors claims or liabilities, which sum up to 41.2 billion. And then owner's claims or equity, 18.1 billion. So assets are resources, obviously, cash, inventory, property, equipment. Now we normally think about assets reported on the balance sheet as something that belongs to the company. And it's typically the case but not always. Why? Because the concept of assets that we emphasize is that of what is being controlled by the company. Normally, when we own an asset, we control it. But sometimes we control assets that we don't own. Like for example, if we lease an asset. Under current accounting principles, we report list assets that we do not own as an asset on the balance sheet. Again, the concept of control is the one that we emphasize. Now, to have a resource reported as an asset on the balance sheet, 
we have some requirements. It has to be that the probability that we will benefit from that resource is relatively high. It has to be that we can measure or we have some idea about the magnitude of the benefits or cash flows that we're going to get from that asset. And so when these two criteria are not satisfied, we don't report an asset on the balance sheet. As a result, many important resources are omitted from the balance sheet. When companies conduct research and development, they are investing in the future, but generally accepted accounting principles say, too much uncertainty. You cannot put R&D asset on your balance sheet. Even though you expect to benefit from it, too much uncertainty about the benefits, so you cannot report an asset. So this means that the balance sheet has important limitation. It omits important resources, generally investments in intangibles. Organic investments in intangibles are omitted from the balance sheet. Another issue with the balance sheet is that assets are reported based on their historical cost. And simply because of inflation, which now is going up again, this means that what we report on the balance sheet could potentially understate the true value by a lot. So here is the balance sheet, the asset side of the balance sheet for Costco. And as you can see, the most significant asset uh, or group of assets are property and equipment, inventory, and cash. But they have additional assets. Now, liabilities are creditors claims, obligations. Now, not all obligations are reported on the balance sheet. It has to be that the other party has performed. So for example, if we have a commitment to buy from a supplier and the supplier is not yet delivered to us, we have an obligation, but not a liability. And we don't recognize it on the balance sheet. So you can see on the balance sheet, if I go back to the balance sheet here, you can see a line between liabilities and equity called commitments and contingencies. But then there is no amount reported for this item. Why? Because just having an obligation does not create a liability. It has to be that the other party has performed. For example, the supplier already delivered to you. Contingencies means there is a potential for a liability, like a pending lawsuit against us. But if the probability that we'll have to pay is not high enough, in the US it's typically 75% or not, IFRS it's 50%, we don't recognize it. And then finally, um, and sorry, before I jump there, we see you the major liabilities that Costco reports, primarily accounts payable, but then also long-term debt and money that they owe employees, accrued salaries and benefits. Equity is the owner's claims on the assets. Now, owners have claims on the assets because they contribute capital into the company. So that's one reason. But then there is another reason. The company operates and over time generates profits. If those profits are retained in the business, they represent an additional claim of shareholders because the profits belong to the shareholders. So within the equity account, we have two types of accounts, contributed capital, which are the first three accounts here. And then we have accounts that represent profits that have already been earned and are yet to be paid to shareholders. So this is big picture, what we get from the balance sheet. 
And we also emphasized that there are omitted assets and omitted obligations, and that even the reported assets are based on historical cost, which could potentially understate the true value of the assets by a lot. So here we have the income statement. Another major statement starts with revenue, the top line, ends with net income for the period. In between, we have four expense line items, typically the major ones, cost of goods sold, selling general and administrative, interest, and income taxes. So essentially, any company, you will find these expense line items. In addition, when companies present the income statement, they report several subtotals before we get to net income. They will tell you what is operating income. They will tell you what is income before income taxes, as you can see. And many companies, not Costco, but many companies will also give us a subtotal for the gross profit. What you get after you subtract from revenue, the cost of the products. As we mentioned, Revenue, we recognize when we deliver, not when we collect cash. Revenue relates to recurring activities, what we normally do. Now we can have a gain or loss from selling equipment, for example, that we no longer use, or from selling an investment. Gains and losses are not included in revenue. They are reported later in the income statement, generally included in a line item such as the one that we see here close to the bottom, interest income and other net. So what would be other net? Gains and losses. But revenue from recurring activities is in the top line. Expenses, as we mentioned earlier on, we recognize the cost of goods and services that we consume during the period in the process of generating revenue. We call this the matching principle. You match the cost against the revenue that they help generate in the same income statement. Expenses like revenue relate to recurring day-to-day -day activities. Okay, and let's switch to the Third primary financial statements, the cash flow statement. So the cash flow statement gives us information about cash flows. And it does it in three sections: operating, investing, and financing. Now we mentioned earlier on that these are the three primary business activities operating, investing, and financing. So if we report all cash flows from these activities, we should be able to fully explain the amount of cash that we generated during the year. So if we add it to the balance of cash at the beginning of the year, we should have the amount of cash reported on the balance sheet. And that's exactly how the cash flow statement ends with the amount of cash that we have on the balance sheet. But when we look at this statement, it's not just about finding out how much cash we have. It's really about getting more information about how the company generated and used cash during the period. And we do it again in three sections. If you read the investing and financing activity sections, you will see that this information is quite straightforward. How much cash we paid to purchase short-term investment? How much cash we paid, repaid for long-term debt? And so on. So the investing and financing activities are relatively simple, straightforward to read and understand. The operating section in contrast is typically presented in an indirect way, where companies basically explain the difference 
between net income measured under a cool accounting and the amount of cash flow that was actually generated during the year. So what the operating section does, it effectively contrasts a cool accounting that we use in preparing the income statement and the balance sheet with cash accounting. So here the company explains why net income in the income statement is different from the net cash flow that was generated during the period. So I hope this gives you some sense of what we get from the three primary financial statements. And I believe with this, I will transition to Scott because I should based on the time. Thank you very much, Daron. So I wanna start this off by saying a lot of great questions come in, so we'll get to those. But I will ask a Professor, I can have a little bit of time after the noon hour with you because I wanna to get to as many as possible. And for everyone who's watching, I know that uh, in case you have to leave early because of your schedule, rest assured we will get you a recording of this so you'll be able to see those questions. So let's get started. The first question is from Ashutosh. Uh, what are the top three critical areas to look at in a balance sheet to assess the health of an organization? Okay, thank you. This is a good question and was very relevant, uh, even more, was, was even more relevant a year, two years ago when we were worried because of COVID, how companies are going to go through the pandemic. Still relevant, obviously, always relevant to evaluate the health of a company. Now the balance sheet provides important information about this in several ways. So one thing you want to do is you want to look at the composition of the funding of the assets, namely liabilities versus equity, and within the liabilities, what type of liabilities we have. In general, the more equity we have, the less liabilities we have, the, the more safe the organization is because equity is essentially a buffer. Equity can absorb losses. Liabilities cannot absorb losses. If you don't pay your obligations, you go bankrupt. So one thing you want to look at is how much equity we have compared to liabilities. Then within the liabilities, you want to see what type of liabilities we have. Like debt liabilities, for example, if you borrow money, you have to pay interest, and then you have to pay the, you have to pay the debt back at specified points in time. So there isn't much flexibility. But accounts payable, companies typically don't pay interest and they have more flexibility or good compensation. On the other end, these liabilities tend to be short-term. So when you have to pay, the liability is also relevant to take into account when you evaluate the health and especially liquidity of the company. On the asset side, you want to get some sense for liquidity. What percentage of the assets are liquid? Specifically, how much cash is sitting on the balance sheet? How much marketable securities do we have? Another dimension that you want to take into account is the collateral value of the assets. Like for example, goodwill and other intangible assets. If the company gets into difficulties, you cannot get much cash out of these assets. But inventory or property plant and equipment or accounts receivable may have better collateral value may have better exit value in case we have difficulties. So these right. are some of the ways. Yeah. So to follow up that Cheryl asked, you know, what are the, then what are the key things to look at on each financial report? Yeah, so we just covered the balance sheet. So let's talk about the income statement. So when you look at the income statement, because value is derived from revenue, you obviously want to know what happens to revenue. Is revenue growing? What is the trend in revenue? So that's obviously very important. But revenue is not profit. Revenue is not net cash flow. So what you want to do next is you want to see, you want to get some sense for the margin. What percentage of the revenue actually ends up as a profit? And you want to do it by thinking about gross profit, which is typically the most stable element. Gross profit will tell you 
what percentage essentially of gross margin, what percentage of uh, revenue, of a dollar of revenue is left after you subtract the cost of the product. And then you want to look at the operating margin, which will subtract not just the cost of the product, but also other operating expenses that companies have to incur in the process of generating revenue. So I would say the trend in sales, the level of and trend in the gross margin, and the level of and trend in the operating margin. These are important metrics to look at. Wonderful. And then, yeah, and then when it comes to the cash flow statement, for the cash flow statement, uh, analysts pay a lot of attention to the relationship between net income and cash from operations. If you ask, if you ask analysts, or if you ask CFOs, or if you ask, you ask other sophisticated users of financial information, how do you evaluate earnings quality? They will tell you number one answer from both analysts and CFOs is we go to the cash flow statement. We look at the trend in net income and we look at the trend in cash from operations. And if we see, for example, that net income is growing year after year, but net cash from operations is actually declining, that's a, a big red flag for the quality of earnings. So the cash flow statement is interestingly used to evaluate earnings quality, the quality of what we have in the income statement. We also look at the cash flow statement to learn about capital expenditures, a major investing cash flow, and what it means, capital expenditures and cash from operations, how much is left essentially when we subtract CapEx from operating cash flow, we call it free cash flow. And that's a measure that people pay a lot of attention to. So these are some of the ways we use the financial statements. Wonderful, thank you. So I, question came in during the, during the webinar I thought was very interesting from Vina. Is, I have a question related to profit and cash. Why is it that a company shows profits but still cash in the bank that does not match the profits? If the expenses are all accounted for, then why is there a difference? Good question, excellent question. The expenses are accounted for under a cool accounting when we consume the good or service, not when we pay for it. So for example, if you buy inventory, you may need to pay a lot of cash to buy the inventory. But if you didn't sell the inventory yet, there's no expense in the income statement. The expense is only when you use the inventory to generate revenue. So think about a company that all that they did during the year was just to buy inventory. Net income is zero. Cash from operation is negative because they did pay cash to buy the inventory. And there are other examples like this. It's essentially a difference between recognizing performance when you deliver and consume the asset versus when you actually receive cash or pay for the expense. Right. All right, this just came in, a hot off the wires. So I want to, Laurie, I understand the concept of equity. Could you give current examples of equity changes in the market? something that describes what to look for in equity statements. So when companies buy back shares, for example, very common, that makes equity on the balance sheet decline. Why? Because the company is taking cash, an asset, and paying it, essentially paying it back to investors. So from the perspective of the balance sheet, we have a decline in cash and we have an asset and we have a decline in equity uh, because we have less equity, because we have less contributed capital when we buy back shares, when the company gives capital back to shareholders. So this is a common example of a transaction, a market transaction that changes the equity uh, that we report on the balance sheet. Great, all right. Thank you for staying a few extra minutes. I have one final question for you I like to, always sort of wrap it up with a, with a key takeaway, get the, keep the energy going. And this came in from several people, very similar questions. Uh, Shinmei, Vipal, Juan, they all asked, are there any 
specific resources to learn more about financial accounting? Obviously, they want to continue with this today. So what can you tell them? Okay. So we offer several executive education programs, and uh, which I obviously highly recommend. Uh, in addition, there is a free resource that you can use. It's quite advanced, but it still has it still covers the basic concepts of accounting, uh, which is a monograph that I'm actually currently working on called earnings quality that you can find if you Google earnings quality, the one you see, you'll find this document and it will dive, it dives deep into financial reporting. But again, it also covers the basic concepts in some sections. Uh, and you can see from the uh, outline uh, where, to, what, where to look for them. Great. Well, thank you so much. Great to work with you as always. You and I have worked together for many years and I look forward to your upcoming programs and the finance and accounting for the non-financial executives coming up in March. On behalf of Columbia Business School Executive Education, Professor Nassim and myself, we wish you a good day. Thank you for joining us at the very center of business. Thank you very much.